Welcome to Petability. I'm your host, Kathy Simons. And I'm your host, Chris Cranston. Our podcast provides interviews and information to help your pets live their best lives. Good afternoon, Kathy. How's it going? Chris, it's going great. It's such a beautiful day here today um, it is. in New England. This is the perfect New England day. Mm-hmm. And I see that the leaves are changing. It's, it's nice. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing like fall in New England, right? I, I know. I know. You know, and I got to tell you this, I, I was sitting out on the deck because it was such a beautiful day. And um, I have some squirrels that live in my yard. You know, I, you know, I, I, I've, you know, I mentioned before we have Steve. Um, and now we also have Megan. We have Megan. Oh, I didn't and, know about Megan. Yeah, we have Megan. And uh, she's the smallest of the squirrels. And she was out there just playing by herself. I mean, I've seen squirrels like chase each other and play a game of chase up the tree. Mm-hmm. Megan, I have a little, a little hill in my backyard. She went to the top of the hill and then she rolled down and then she went back up. What? She rolled down again. And then I thought, like, oh, like a kid at the playground. Yeah, yeah like get the playground. And then I thought, oh God, I hope something's not wrong with her. So I, I, I get a little closer. She, no, she's playing. She's playing. And she's running around and playing and just jumping around. And then she saw me and she's like, I'm out of here. Uh, As a rehabber, you had to make sure she didn't have some neurological disorder. Right? I was like, oh boy, what's happening? And it wasn't like head over butt. It was like rolling down, you know, and then you get back up and roll down again. I've never seen wow. that. Never seen it either. We do have squirrels of plenty out here though. Mm-hmm. That's for sure. And, and I, I remember mentioning to somebody the other day, like drive extra cautiously because right. they are like suicidal right now in the sense yeah. that they're so focused on getting their, their nuts for hibernation and, and all of that, that they are not paying attention to the cars. They are not. I've never seen a squirrel play like this. It was adorable. And I have checked on her since this morning to make sure that she is indeed okay. And she is on on top of the fence doing her squirrel thing. So I worry about Megan. She's smaller than the other squirrels, but anyway, I'll keep an eye on her. Um, So listen, how is your friend Joker doing? We talked last week about the kitten that you have. Yes. That had to have an eye removed mm-hmm. at an initiation and you had some sleepless nights <laughs> with him. Well, that was thing. brief. I mean, I, I was worried, right? As a good foster parent should be, but man, Kathy, it's as if this surgery never happened. <laughs> he, okay. The cone lasted one day, despite your great advice. <laughs> and I then reached out to the rescue to see if I could discontinue his pain meds because Mm -hmm. he did not seem painful at all. And so we kind of played with that a little bit. You know, he hated me squirting the medicine in his mouth. And so I, I stopped and no change in behavior. He has been headbutting since like post-op day one. That's what he loves to do. And you know, so he's still flipping over on his back and being flopsy mopsy and headbutting and purring. And now his, his whiskers that they had to shave around his eye, they're growing in. So they're like really pokey. Um, but he, I talked to the rescue yesterday and we're going to be writing up a profile in the next day or two. He is ready for adoption. That's fantastic. You know, I'm always impressed with how quickly cats can heal. It's, mm. it's amazing. I think mother nature has been very, very kind to the cat because their ability to heal is just so, uh, it's kind of a little bit awe inspiring. Honestly, they, (laughs) they, they, they really do. They really heal and adapt really well. So it's really exciting that Joker's ready for home. Mm -hmm. And you know what? He's going to do just fine with one eye. Oh yeah. Yeah, He doesn't need it. He's fine. And and that's what the placement person asked, you know, and and I'm like, Oh, you, you don't even know. He only has one eye. You wouldn't even know. Right. Good, good, good. good. And to your point. Yes. I think uh, mother nature loves, loves her cats. We've always talked about them being superior beings. So I think mother nature loves her cats. Yeah. I was just going to say, I was a little bit worried, but in the end it, uh, you know, ended up being a pleasure. So yeah, that's great news. Yeah. So, so Chris today, um, let me tell you what's going on today. Because, you know, we talk a lot about other animals today. We talk we, in our other shows, we've talked about dogs and we've talked about cats and chickens and geese and even our friend Penelope, the pig. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, every once in a while, I like to get on the air with you and just sort of highlight um, some pet that's living their best life. Right. Right. And so today. So remember, you know, we did it before. Remember, we did it early on. We interviewed Dominic Scudera with his with his dogs he has uh at two leg dogs Mm -hmm. at instagram he has not one not two but three dogs with two logs three two-legged dogs three two-legged dogs and six legs um, amongst three dogs three dogs and those dogs are living it 
up. You know, Dominic takes good care of them and they're really happy and just joyful, to, joyful to watch. Well, I'll tell you what I found um, a tortoise on Instagram that <laughs> I am absolutely in love with. And her name is uh, Ethel the Glamour Tort. And she's living her best life out there in California. Um, she, she's just a joy to follow, you know, and I'm completely invested, completely invested in Ethel <laughs> because she's so interesting. And so I really wanted to talk today about tortoises. You know, yeah. I think that there may be, um, so Ethel's out there living her best life. You know, she's got these great owners and this great enclosure and she, they take her for walks and, um, she's just really living it up. And her, her, her IG is just such a pleasure to follow. Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about tortoises because I think there might be sort of a misconception that having a tortoise is maybe an easy pet, but they put a lot of effort into taking care of Ethel. So, so I'm really interested to talk to Ethel's mom, Casey, today and find out all about Ethel the Glamour Tort and tortoises in general. Yeah, I'm excited too. I've, I've had a little fantasy about, uh, about getting a tortoise and I've looked into rescue, um, but there, there didn't seem to be any close by. I didn't run into any yeah. luck there, but um, yeah, so excited to, to talk to Casey today. So please give a warm welcome for our guest today, Casey Kuczynski with Ethel the Glamour Tort. Welcome Casey and Ethel. Hi, <laughs> Ethel can't talk, but she's saying hi too. Awesome. But she would. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're really excited to have you today. And one of the things I thought uh, would be a good place to start would be describing the difference because Ethel's a tortoise, right? So what is yes. the difference between a tortoise and a turtle? Because I hear people juxtapose those terms all the time, mm -hmm. but there is a difference. Mm -hmm. So um, actually, Ethel is a turtle. She is a specific kind of turtle called a tortoise. Oh. So there's a, an umbrella. So you have your Shalonian umbrella, which is all of the shelled critters. And under that umbrella is turtles. They're all called turtles. So that's like kind of the turtle umbrella. And then you have your sea turtles, you have your terrapins, and you have your tortoises. So a tortoise is a land-dwelling animal. It lives in a desert kind of area, and it's an arid environment, and it's an herbivore, and it, you know, grazes and does all of that. Your terrapin is your freshwater turtle. So it's, you know, your little pond turtles, your little river turtles, and they're usually um, not necessarily herbivores. They'll eat fish and little bugs and stuff like that, too. And then you have your sea turtles, which everybody knows a lot about sea turtles because they're very cute and popular <laughs> and, <Yep. laughs> and, uh, because of finding Nemo and all that. <laughs> That's exactly so, what I was you know, thinking. <laughs> yeah. So your sea turtle is your large, uh, saltwater ocean tortoise or turtle, sorry, mm -hmm. uh, that, you know. So that's kind of the difference there is they're all actually turtles. They're just different mm. types of turtles. I did not and know that's, that. you know, I don't correct people on Instagram when they're like, oh, she's not a turtle. She's a tortoise. I'm like, well, technically she's both, but <laughs> you know, okay. <laughs> as long as I, Ethel's, as long as Ethel's not offended, I think. We're yeah. Okay. She doesn't <laughs> really care <laughs> what you call her as long as oh. you have snacks. <laughs> exactly. I didn't know that either. I was looking I was researching for this very intriguing podcast with a different type of pet than we usually talk about. And one of the things, as you mentioned, Casey, was that tortoises are typically land dwelling, whereas our layman's thought about turtles is they do tend to be in water, whether it's fresh or salt water. Yeah. And for that reason, their uh, shells are different shaped. So a turtle shell ten tends to be more hydrodynamic for them being in, in water, so it's flatter, whereas a tortoise shell is very highly domed. Yeah, and that's mostly because they actually do climb a lot. So having the high dome enables them to, if they flip over, they can rock themselves back and forth and hopefully catch something and turn themselves right side again. Oh. Um, it's, you know, it's an, an ability to, like, you know, be a more a uh, dexterous animal, even though they don't have like a <laughs> bendable spine. It helps them right. You wouldn't think easier. of a turtle. You wouldn't think of a, a tortoise as a flexible animal. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> they're not at all. It's very. <laughs> yeah. So it, this, I'm just wondering, you know, uh, how did you end up with, with Ethel? How did, what made you pick a tortoise versus another sort of typical pet, your dog or your cat, or what, what drew you to the tortoise? 
Well, uh, Dan and I are both um, somewhat sensitive to like furry animals. Uh, I just sort of suffer through when it comes to dogs because I love dogs. (laughs) But uh, but with like our home environment, we were thinking like we would prefer a hypoallergenic animal. So that kind of like put us in the range of like maybe three or four different kinds of pets. Where, you know, you have your, like, your doodles, those are hyperallergenic, but then you still have, like, a dog to uh, need you constantly. Right. <laughs> and then you have, like, we were thinking maybe a pig, but pigs are just, like, ironically, we were like, well, it's going to be too big. <laughs> Uh, and then uh I always kind of had a thing for reptiles so I was like okay well let's see if we can think about like a reptile pet that we could get um and I have had a tortoise in the past I had a smaller breed Russian tortoise I really can't trace back where my interest in tortoises came from like we were trying to do this before or I was like I don't know I always just kind of liked them um one thing I can think of that was uh, that is like what I model my life after is uh, in a series of unfortunate events. There's the Uncle Monty character who has his like whole uh, crazy mansion with all of his like weird critters. And he especially has a giant sulcata tortoise. And that's kind of like how I envisioned my life <laughs> <laughs> moving forward. Is like, I kind of want that as my life. And that's how it's, <laughs> and, play, it's playing out well, Casey. It's playing yeah, out honestly, well. <laughs> like the other day I was like, I'm like, we're like full on Uncle Monty vibes around here and I'm here for it. <laughs> so Casey, where did you get Ethel then? Um, <laughs> And you also so, mentioned, sorry, I was just going to say, you mentioned that, you know, the irony of the pig being too big. Uh, I've seen on your, her Instagram that uh, you got her, she was so tiny. So can you describe mm-hmm. to our audience how little she was when you got her and how big she is now? Like, what does she weigh? I'm yeah. Going so uh, we got her, well, we tried and tried because um, online and everyone says like sulcata tortoises are like the number are one of the number one animals that get put up for adoption and people are always looking to rehome their tortoises so we were on all the forums and we were in all the shelters looking for one Mm -hmm. um to to take in and i I don't know where all of these (laughs) things are coming from because there was never a tortoise available for us there was a couple that we tried to go get especially one, uh, it was like a three hour drive away from us. And I like, I left work early and was like, let's go, we're getting this tortoise. And by the time we got there, it had already been adopted. (laughs) So we were just failing and failing and failing at trying to adopt a tortoise. So I was like, you know what, let's just, let's just get one. Let's just get a baby tortoise. And so uh, there's plenty of breeders around. And so we did a ton of research to find a really reputable one. Um, We found uh, Redfoot Ranch in Florida is where we ended up um, looking, and that's where we got Ethel from. And, and she, she was so tiny; she fit in like the palm of your hand. Like I think I measured her when we first got her, and she was like one and a half inches long from like oh my tip tip to tip. So tiny, like un- I can't even I can't really remember <laughs> how tiny. <laughs> Like, I can't, like, my brain doesn't, like, imagine her as so tiny anymore. Um, because now she's five, we're five years later. Yeah. And she's uh, pushing 50 pounds. She's 40, mm. <clears throat> 42 pounds. And it just feels like she gets heavier every day. Um, but yeah, she's humongous. I don't even know how long she is anymore. She's over a foot long, for sure. She um, wasn't much bigger than a strawberry. I've seen on no, Instagram. She wasn't no, she was no, she was so small. Strawberry. Like yeah. <laughs> I have this picture framed in my house of her eating a blueberry, and the blueberry is as big as her head. <laughs> oh my just... god, she's struggling with a blueberry. It's, it's honestly it's crazy to imagine. Like I can't even remember, and it was only five years ago, just because she grew so fast. Wow. And, you know, and every we knew she was going to grow huge. We wanted her to grow huge. That's what we were anticipating and what we wanted. Um, but the actual rate of her growth is astonishing. Mm. Yeah. Well, I, we were like, we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like she's going to be humongous and like really big, but like, she's also going to live 80 years. So we got time, but yeah. turns out 
Yeah. <laughs> Turns out not so much. <laughs> you know, I was I was heartened to hear you say that, you know, you did try to, you know, go through rescue and that sort of thing, because I've done a little bit of research myself, Casey, and also had the same experience, could not find any. Um, mm-hmm. I wasn't as adamant about it as as you and um, but that you found a reputable breeder, because that's always what we say for you know, our dog and cat friends. Right. And Mm -hmm. I think that's something really important for our audience to hear is, you know, do your research and, you know, again, I kind of, you know, against the going to the local pet store and, you know, buying, you know, because you don't know where those came from. And a lot of times they've lived in horrible conditions. Mm -hmm. They're not healthy. You know, they're being imported, you know, illegally, depending on what you're getting and so forth. So, So that was great that, that you guys did all of that work to, to find Ethel. Yeah. I mean, it's also a matter of when you have a hatchling tortoise, they are very susceptible to a lot of things. They're really fragile animals. So if you're not going through somebody who really knows what they're doing, uh, you could succumb to having a really sad situation happen to you. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, we really didn't want that. We wanted a very healthy, um, well-bred tortoise who was going to be, you know, (laughs) very like strong, you know, (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, she is. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And turns out she's, I mean, I don't know. Everybody is, uh, we've heard lots of different people who have sulcatas and turns out we actually have a, a neighbor down the street who has one. We have, there's tons of people in our area who actually have sulcatas. When we take her out, people are like, oh yeah, I have one. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Cool. Right. Didn't know that. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but uh, uh, she's really spunky for her um type she's very fast she's like active and uh very like curious apparently Mm. i've never had another one of the same type so i wouldn't know i don't really know uh anything other than her but from what we've heard is she's very like uh energetic which is interesting to me her personality and i and i it could be personality. I'm sure it is, but also it speaks to, to your care and how much, you know, you've devoted to her. You mentioned that, um, cause I kind of want to circle back that she's expected to live approximately 80 years. And, you know, generally I think tortoises and turtles often live 50 to a hundred years. And that's definitely something people no- need to know. And I know you're, you and Dan are, are both young people, but it's something that people have to plan for if they get a, a tortoise in terms of what if something happens, you know, where does this, this tortoise go, you know, and, and that sort of thing. So have you and Dan thought about that with her longevity? Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, it's also, you know, it's, it's really not that uncommon of a thing. Like, uh, they have a a similar life expectancy to a human being and also uh, like parrots. And there's a lot of other animals that live a really long time. Um, It's, you know, we're, we're not too worried about it. And it's probably one of the things that I love the most about having a tortoise is that I know that like, uh, I'm not going to (laughs) have to worry about her like life expectancy and I'll be able to grow old with her. Um, and that's something that like we can count on, you know, more or less, obviously accidents can happen, but you know, God forbid. So, (laughs) um, and and can you imagine the bond that develops with a, with an animal that that happens over over that, that time frame is pretty cool. You're right. Yeah. I honestly think it's, it's almost, it's really, she's our child, you know, we're going to have her the rest of our life. Lives, and it's something that we can really uh, expect, you know, yeah. um, that being said, uh, for when we do um, need to rehome her and we're incapable of her care um, down the line, we have a, a just good giant handful of nieces and nephews <laughs> who are Perfect. all very excited to take over, um, especially our oldest niece, Adeline, who's uh, our actually our next door neighbor. We <laughs> That's perfect. So the kids, yeah. so the kids are over all the time. Yeah. The kids know Ethel, the kids, uh, interact with her a lot and they get training and Adeline actually babysits Ethel all the time. Um, even when we're here, like say I can't come home for lunch one day, uh, Adeline will come over and, uh, care for Ethel in those times. So she's getting real hands-on training on how to, how to take, take over. 
nice. Yes. And it's she's, like, uh, she's down for it. She's, yeah. <laughs> she's, like, she said she wants that they'll win. <laughs> yeah. You've got a, you've got a ready made, you know, network uh, and it's an entire family affair. That's, that's fantastic. How totally. Big you, how big do you expect Ethel to get then if she does, you know, continue to, to grow and grow? What is she going to max out at in terms of pounds? Do you know? Well, uh, so cottage tortoise can get up to 200 pounds and she's really, I'm thinking she's going to be up there. Like she's so big already. Gosh, (laughs) I was kind of thinking at first, I was like, well, she seems to be growing a little slower, like the first year, which is, you know, silly to base off of that. I'm like, oh, maybe she'll be a smaller one. Nope. She's wow. She is. She's going to be a big one. I think. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Jeez. So we've alluded to this a little bit about your, your great care of, of Ethel. And again, there may be a misconception out there that, that turtles, tortoises, or reptiles in general are easy to care for. Can you talk about her needs and, and what you do to you know, make her life the best that it can be? Yeah. I mean, they're easy and they're hard. There's certain aspects that are really easy with her. Like for instance, right now I'm sitting on the couch talking to you guys. She's out in the yard, minding her own business. She doesn't really care what I'm doing (laughs) and she leaves me alone most of the time. And then, you know, uh, we can leave all day long and she's super chill, like doesn't really need the, um, the, she doesn't need the like affection or she doesn't need, um, us to be around all the time. She doesn't need a lot of attention. Um, they're very solitary animals in the wild. They live on their own all day long. They only really come together during mating season and then they're off on their own for the rest of their lives, essentially. So that's really easy. We can leave for several days at a time. And as long as someone's here to drop in and feed her and make sure she's like doing all right, turn her lights on. She doesn't really care beyond that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then she does uh, enjoy interacting with us when we are here, but you know, more or less, she's not uh, very needy. Uh, the things that are hard are just general like care. Um, feeding is hard because there's not just like tortoise food plethora available at the, tor- at the tortoise store, you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> those things right. don't exist. We end up growing a lot of her food. So it's like a lot of um, gardening knowledge that you need to have all of a sudden, and then, uh, you know, you, you're gonna have to get comfortable with going to a feed store because she eats hay. So we had to find, you know, it's, it's like having a barnyard animal, you know, it's, it's just a little bit more, it's not as easy as popping to your local mm-hmm. pet shop and getting right. what you need. Right. Um, it takes a little bit more resourcefulness and like getting what she needs to eat and all of that. Um, and then she's very destructive. <laughs> Ah, Ethel. she's Do she's tell. big. She's big and heavy and sharp. <laughs> and so you know, like if you look around our house, everything at the bottom of our furniture is scratched. <laughs> like we don't have, oh, sure. you know, we just we can't have nice things. And if we do, we just have to be okay with the bottoms of them being scratched because she's gonna rub up against it and scratch it. Yeah. And she like if there's a corner that she likes, she'll dig in the corner and uh you know scratch the wall and all that so you just kind of we I mean I have like a whole cupboard full of like wall tools <laughs> and like right. plaster plaster and paint and all that stuff to patch everything and um and then you know the potty issue she, she you can't really train a tortoise so it's <laughs> she does mm. what she wants when she wants and usually she goes to the bathroom outside today she decided not to so you know <laughs> today I'm gonna have to go shampoo my carpet real quick <laughs> and <laughs> so figure that out yeah. Speaking speaking of bathroom habits, Casey, I don't even know like what that looks like in terms of what comes out of them. I mean, is it one thing? Oh my gosh. Like a- it's a lot. It's a giant, huge doo doo. I don't. <laughs> But I mean, do they urinate? Do they urinate and defecate, or is it just yeah. like a bird that does you know one so, thing? Yeah. So tortoise anatomy is that they have a cloaca like a bird. So, uh, if you have a a chicken or something like that, you might be, you might be aware of like how a cloaca works. It's like Mm -hmm. the one hole. So you just have like the one exit hole and everything comes out of there. So if, uh, she laid eggs, the eggs would come out of there. Boy tortoises, their anatomy comes out of there. Like all of the poo and pee and everything comes out of that one hole. Mm -hmm. Um, she so it's it's a very efficient system. It goes in her mouth, goes through comes her, out comes out the other end. 
essentially. <laughs> They're very rudimentary. Um, <laughs> you but- mentioned you mentioned eggs and, you know, I was thinking like birds and chickens, you know, so they lay eggs whether they're mm-hmm. fertilized or not. Yeah. What happens with, with our tortoise friends? Well, uh, so here's some, some tea. Ethel is not actually a girl. Ethel is a boy. So, <gasps> oh my God, this is yeah. scandalous. You heard it here on- I'm not, I'm not secretive about it. It's a lot Chris. of people are noticing that they can, you know, who know, uh, who can tell the difference between a male and female tortoise. They, you, they're already you heard fluent it into it. On pedibility, the scandal. Of- <laughs> <laughs> but, um, we have it on good authority that she doesn't really care what she's called. Yeah. So we're just mm-hmm. going to keep calling her a she cause it's yeah. easier. And we were, that's how we feel about her I don't know (laughs) yeah so um so she will never lay eggs for obvious reasons um but if she were actually a female um she would lay eggs once a year um a clutch of eggs and uh it's actually I'm actually really glad that she isn't female because it's really common for um for uh tortoises in captivity to get egg bound which is uh when they don't when they don't feel like they have somewhere to dig deep enough or if they uh or are just in a weird state of comfort where they don't um feel like they want to lay eggs <laughs> and what they just they get- their body will hold on to it and they can solidify and can be a really big problem health wise so do they get calcium deficient if they lay that many you know they lay a bunch of eggs or a ton of eggs they that- could but with a with a pretty with a regular diet, it wouldn't really necessarily be a problem. Mm-hmm. They only, they don't lay often enough that it would be problem a huge, yeah. huge problem with calcium. As long as you're actually, you know, I supplement her food with calcium twice a week. So that would be sufficient enough. Yeah. Um, yeah. Granted, she's not a girl, so it doesn't really, doesn't matter. <laughs> it really, it really won't be a problem. We're speaking hypotheticals, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and can we go back to, we were talking about her lights. Like as long as you were saying, as long as she's got her lights and she can get outside and someone can come by and check on her. She's happy. But what is that? Is she basking? Is she getting warm? What is the, yeah. what are the lights for? <laughs> well, honestly, in the summer, she does not need the lights because yeah. she just, she could go outside and get sunshine and she does all day long. It's just her preference that she likes to wake up to her lights. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. kind of like her morning coffee. Like her lights are right outside her bed. So I'll flick the lights on in the morning and then she'll like crawl under her lights and bask for like a, a little while and then make her way outside. It's just like her like warm up for the day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which is very unnecessary in the summer and just a waste of energy if we're being honest. But uh <laughs> she likes it. So we just still do it. And then but yeah. then in the winter time when she's stuck inside, when it's too cold for her to be outside, she does rely on the lights for vitamin D and for um and for warmth. For warmth. So she'll sit under her lights. In the winter time, she brewmates. So uh tortoises don't really hibernate. They well Sulcata tortoises, I'll be specific, um, don't hibernate, they brumate. So they just slow down a lot in the winter, but they don't fully like go to sleep. Hmm. So she will be, um, she does brumate. So she kind of wakes up, goes under her lights, comes to see if there's anything interesting to eat in the kitchen, <laughs> and then pretty much goes back to goes back to bed and sits in her bed and just sort of is there all day and relaxes hmm. all day. So in the wintertime, she's kind of barely out, Mm -hmm. Um, but, and then she, her just whole schedule kind of slows down in the winter. And, uh, but, so we're kind of heading that way. We still got a good, like, probably mid-November is when she really starts slowing down for the winter. Um, But like, even today it'll warm up. It's already warm enough for her to be outside, but uh, she's not. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway. (laughs) I think it's interesting because uh, I believe you live in in California. And so if somebody were to get a tortoise and, you know, like we're in New England and and it's awful in the the winter, um, what, I guess, what temperatures can they tolerate, um, you know, for those that are in different climates and such, how, Mm -hmm. how cold can they withstand? So or they hot. can withstand like, uh, I'm trying to remember like the, the exact limits. I don't put ethyl out if it's not going to be above 60 degrees. Okay. So 60 degrees is my threshold for her. Um, anything lower than that, they are susceptible to respiratory infection. Um, mm. so I don't like to put her out if it's below 60. Um, right. I'll, I'll make her stay inside. Um, but 
I think the actual limit is a lot lower than that. Hmm. I think they can get a little bit colder than that and still be okay. Um, a lot of people who have tortoises in colder climates, they will have just like a giant shed that they keep the tortoises in in the winter that's heated. Um, okay. And that's kind of just where they live all winter. <laughs> well, yeah. And there are some climates that never get above 60. You know, yeah. And even... if you live in one of those climates, I would just say maybe a tortoise isn't for you. <laughs> exactly. Right? exactly. Because they are, they are a desert animal. So, you know, you're taking your animal far away from like a climate where they belong. It gets harder and harder to maintain that tortoise, that animal's um, happiness, you know? Yeah. I remember researching a little bit too. And, and, it was specifically a Russian tortoise. And they said, this is great because they originate from the Northern hemisphere. So their clock, if you will, is similar to, to ours in the, in the U S is that something people should think about as well? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Different, different species of tortoises will have wildly different care needs. It's not like one in the same. Like they all have, they have different diets. They have different temperature needs. They have different, all kinds of things. There's a lot of similarities, but there's even a tortoise that lives in the wild in the snow. Um, I can't remember what kind it is. It's a type of box turtle that's like in Siberia or something. So Mm. they're all over and they have all sorts of different kinds of care needs. Um, And if you are in a colder climate, or even a hotter climate, a drier climate, like you should do some research into what kind of best fits your area. Right. I think that kind of goes for most reptiles because reptiles are very specific to, they have climate needs more than just dietary and uh, other needs. How about yeah. the, um, how about the, how about the rest of Ethel? Like as far as her needs go, like, does she get, does she get her nails trimmed like a dog or a cat would? <laughs> does she ever need to have her shell? Like, shaved or I don't even know what you would call it. (laughs) What does she she require as far as something like a nail trim and shell Um, care? So we, we take her on lots of walks on sidewalk and then we have a lot of concrete area on our, um, in our yard. And so her nails never need maintenance. Mm -hmm. Um, she walks enough and she gets enough exercise that it wears them down, um, plenty on her own. Um, and they don't grow as fast enough in the winter to be a problem. So we've never had an issue with her nails or her claws. Um, uh, other than that, she has a pond. That's where she soaks. They need to be able to soak. And that's how they drink water is they want to be fully in a puddle to drink water. Um, and, uh, and it's good for their skin to, to, be, um, to have a little bit of moisture. In the wild, they would just seek out puddles. So that's kind of, uh, what you're trying to replicate is a, a puddle. puddle. Um, so not like too deep, pretty shallow, uh, in the winter time, we'll stick her in the bathtub, although she's getting too big for the bathtub. <laughs> so I don't really know what we're going to do in a couple of years. We're gonna have to upgrade. Um, let me ask you this about her shell. Um, sometimes I see, sometimes I see Dan scratching her and she's like, <laughs> she seems really into it. Does her shell have, she have sensation to the shell? Uh-huh. Yeah, there's nerve endings all throughout her shell. So uh, it's almost, it would probably, I mean, I don't know exactly what she feels, but I assume it would be a lot like uh, someone like kind of petting the top of your fingernails Mm. where you, you can feel the vibration and you can feel the skin underneath because it's not really, her shell isn't that thick. It's maybe like, I don't know. It's, it's like a overgrown fingernail, you know, uh, but uh, she can feel everything. Um, I think that is a misconception that tortoises mm-hmm. can't feel their shells. They really can. Um, she honestly seems uh, to enjoy it. When I see her, do, she seems like she's enjoying that interaction. She has butt wiggles. Yeah, she does I butt wiggles. I know. She's, she loves, she likes to scratch her shell on her, especially the back of her shell on anything. So if you have like a broom or something out, she'll like do her little like booty, <laughs> her booty, booty shake on the on the broom to scratch the back of her shell. Cause uh, I imagine it gets itchy and she can't turn around and <laughs> right. Right. Do anything. So mm-hmm. that's like the most that her, the back of her ever gets felt is when something else is touching it. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so, yeah, she, she likes, I think she likes it. It's kind of hard to know. It's yeah, like, it she acts like she likes it and she'll come back around and like, you know, a lot more. <laughs> so. so it actually kind of, that kind of like brings me to my next question, because I want to talk a little bit about 
like Ethel's or not just Ethel, but in general, the, I'm always interested in the emotional lives of animals. And so I'm always, when I watch Ethel's videos, what I see, you know, it's fun and it's so positive and it's joyful. But what I'm really seeing as a canine, as a rehabber, as a rehab person, I'm thinking, look at all this enrichment she has. It's so great. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about her emotional life. And I know it's hard to speak for her because you're not a turtle, <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, I'm interested to see, does Ethel, does she express herself? Can you see if she expresses herself? Like it seems that she really enjoys being scratched on her shell. And there certainly must be times when she feels displeased or annoyed about something, right? Yeah. <laughs> it must be something. So can we talk a little bit about o- Ethel and, and her emotional life? How she, how you feel she expresses herself? Yeah, she absolutely expresses herself. And it's, I think it's funny because people think it's weird when I say, oh, Ethel's in a bad mood today <laughs> because they're like, what do you mean? How would you know? But you really do. It's subtle, but like when you live with this animal, you can tell when she's having a good day and when she's pissed <laughs> <laughs> and she gets angry and she gets upset and she'll mostly if she is that way, well, so her, the things that clue me into when she's mad, she has like three emotions. She's mad. Uh, she's annoyed. And then she's like very happy and excited. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like kind of the swing is very like, you know, it's rudimentary emotion, but it's there and, uh, and hungry. I guess uh-huh. I'd say hungry is another emotion because she will, she's very destructive when she's hungry if I'm here in the house and she wants food, she will be on me. So she'll be like around my feet and then kind of drift off and just like push a chair over or like, you know, get start getting into something she knows I don't want her to get into and like all that stuff. And I'm like, okay, fine. I will go feed you. <laughs> and then the moment I feed her, she's like, cool. She's like, thanks. And then like does her own thing again. <laughs> she's so, like, cool, cool. We're cool. It's cool. <laughs> yeah. So she just comes and starts like messing stuff up in the house basically. And that's how I know like, okay, you're hungry and you yeah. want to eat and you're annoyed at me because I'm sitting here and I'm not feeding you. I'm working. <laughs> like, <laughs> It's fascinating to me how she communicates with you like that. Like I'm, I'm annoyed. And I'm going to, I'm going to show you. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And so, like, oh, you like this vase? I'm going to knock it over <laughs> <laughs> right? like, until you start getting giving me some food lady. That's sort of like having a cat. Yeah. yeah. Um, so how would you describe how you and Dan uh, bond with her? Would you say that the bonding happens from interactions like feeding or the scratching? I know she likes to take walks. I love it when you post vote videos of her taking a walk because she's just walking down the street. Um, and she's, she appears to be what I would say very content with it. Um, you know, again, you're right. I don't know for sure. I don't know what Ethel's emotions are, but how did you and Dan create this bond with Ethel? I think really with an animal, like a a reptile and a tortoise and animals that aren't necessarily very interactive by nature, Mm -hmm. it's more of just being present around them. So you're not forcing interaction with them. We never, we didn't try to like force her to want to be around us too much. Um, especially when she was little, I didn't handle her all that much. I handled her when necessary and like for a few moments a day or a little bit. And especially because knowing that like she wouldn't be able to be picked up Mm -hmm. her whole life, you know, we didn't want her to feel Mm -hmm. like that was a normal part of life. But um, uh, also it's just, we just, we've, we try and just hang out with her side by side as much as we can. So, uh, I work from home half the time, so I'm home a lot with her. So I can kind of just like be eating my lunch in the yard while she's roaming around the yard. Mm -hmm. And it sort of like gives her this idea that I belong in her space and that her space is also my space and we share the space and it's okay. And it's, uh, and that's kind of like, I feel like the best you can get with a reptile Mm -hmm. is for them to agree to share their space with you (laughs) because it really is her space. It's not ours. (laughs) She runs the, she runs the house. (laughs) So uh, she welcomes us into her space at this point where she doesn't feel threatened by us. She actually like wants to come up to us and spend time next to us. She doesn't like rub against us, Mm -hmm. but you know, it's high praise if a tortoise comes and sits next to you and just stays there. 
I, well, that's I where you're like, song. oh my gosh, you I, really care. We've been, we've been accepted. Yeah, like uh, that's about as best as you're going to get uh, <laughs> as far I, as affection. I love your approach with her. You're right. Just having the, <clears throat> just the having you guys all exist together in the same space and her feeling safe about that um, is, is fantastic. You're right. I think you're right. I think for reptiles, that's probably the highest compliment you can get. We're going to share this space and I feel safe. Yeah. So that's great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I and read. we give her lots of treats. Food is also a big part of it. She likes that we have food. <laughs> and I did read Casey that, uh, well, that turtles, tortoises are very intelligent, much more than we give them credit for, that they can recognize people. And that one of the ways of expressing, again, the happiness, the joy, the bonding is they said when there is a, a tortoise on a mission, they will approach you, you know, and mm-hmm. there's nothing stopping them, you know, that that's, uh, you know, happiness that they are, you know, plodding along and, and marching and they can move fast. I think that's one mm-hmm. of the misconceptions too, but that they will, uh, you know, quickly approach and, and that is also a very good sign. Yeah. I mean, they can move very fast, probably faster than you'd expect. However, you will still be able to outrun it. <laughs> <laughs> if like it's a coming dog. at you and you're scared you can you could get out of the way in time <laughs> but uh <laughs> you know not that fast <laughs> but but yeah I actually I posted a video a while back of we brought Ethel to the park and there was a bunch of kids and they're the kids are always so interested in her and they were kind of all around her and she was sort of leading the pack of kids around um but you can see in that video uh, her head is fully out. She's looking around. Her eyes are open. She's interacting with the kids. And like, that's kind of how you know that she's really comfortable in the situation. Um, even having all these kids around her, she wasn't, if she starts ducking her head in her shell, if she slows down or if she's like, doesn't seem to be uh, interested in the outside world, that's when you know that she's stressed. So uh, yeah, you can kind of see in that video, like she really does love people and she kind of, whenever we take her out, I'm always surprised at how comfortable she is around people and kids and everybody and how much she lets them like be around her. Yeah. How about other animals? Does she have other animals? She does not care about other animals. It's kind of funny to me. I don't know that even she just, it's like they are just part of the scenery. (laughs) <laughs> it's okay. the it's the other animals that really react to her yeah, they're so, curious. yeah I don't know if you've seen the video we posted we took her to this um farm sanctuary and all the cows are like just so curious about her and like the the roosters and the chickens are like what is this animal and the goats are all following her around and she's just like doo, like <laughs> going yeah. on her business like yeah I guess I'm the center of attention everywhere I go with everyone <laughs> just That's the way fine. I like it <laughs> yeah whatever everybody can just like fawn on me that's fine (laughs) but she doesn't really I don't know she doesn't seem to like she's not acknowledging them yeah (laughs) yeah she's just like whatever (laughs) hey let's circle back to uh like her habitat a little bit because I remember I took my first job out of college in Tucson and a friend of mine's dad worked at the Sonora Desert Museum that's just cool. The first time I went over to her house, I looked out in the backyard and I think I saw four tortoises and I'm like, what? It's just, oh yeah, my dad, you know, rehabs tortoises and they live here and what have you. But there were mounds of dirt and tunnels. And I think she said that they had to reinforce their fence down maybe like four feet or something. So Mm -hmm tortoises are big diggers and how do you uh you know establish their safety in in terms of that yep um that is absolutely true um and that goes into the destruction thing Mm. as well (laughs) like they dig they they push things over they if they get something in their head they will just continue to go for it for days weeks months like she has this little hole she's digging in our yard that she's been working on all summer um <laughs> it's a we, fine I keep, hole I keep putting a little bit more dirt in it every once in a while and she's like god it's just like won't dig but <laughs> so uh we kind of have it uh she has a few little like areas where I let her dig because they don't really lead to anywhere 
Mm -hmm. Um, and then, uh, all of our fencing is double enforced. So we have like the, the actual fence that leads to the outside. And then we have planter beds that go all the way around the whole fence. So there's like a layer of dirt and then another heavy piece of wood in, in between, uh, where the actual like fence is and that, and then, uh, most of our yard is actually concrete, like, uh, where the, the planter beds are and where the fence is. So her like grass areas and stuff, they don't lead to anywhere. Um, so the actual situation we're in right now is really great as far as like keeping her contained. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's not that she, uh, doesn't, she, if she could, she would leave for the day, go around the neighborhood and come straight back to bed. They have, uh, they have a really, um, uh, they really like to have the same spot. Um, she goes to the same spots every single day. She wants to sleep in the same spot every single night. The problem is, is that she would probably go too far from home. And then by the time it starts getting cold and dark, she would just fall asleep wherever she was. Um, huh. and then maybe not make it home again. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> I, so I heard it's that- not that it's not that they want to get away from where they're living. They actually like living in one spot. It's that they might go too far and not be able to get back in time to get to bed. Right. Gotcha. They like to roam. They have yeah. these pathways yes. that, that they roam. And I think you, yeah. you mentioned earlier too, that, um, you know, not only are tortoises great, great diggers, but they're also climbers. Right. Mm -hmm. So do you ever create obstacles for her to in terms of exercise or is her just natural environment kind of her her daily obstacle course? Well, she creates her own obstacles a lot of the time by knocking things over. Yeah, she'll knock things over and then climb over them all day. She has her favorite leaf pile right now, again, in the video that I'm going to post later today. But uh, we've you know, in the fall, we sweep up all the leaves. And so she'll just kind of like run through that all day. Like (laughs) she just. She just goes around in circles and, and messes up the leaf pile. So I have to it again. And, you know, <laughs> it's fun. But it's fun. I think a lot of it's like Kathy and I talk about too. You don't have to, you know, be a rocket scientist. You can just kind of look around at nature and what various species are born to do. And then mm-hmm. it's pretty easy to create enrichment, you know, once you put your, your mind to it or, you know, exercise yeah. opportunities and that sort of thing, because even for a, a turtle slash tortoise, you know, I think it's important us as rehabbers, you know, we're like movement, 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 and, you know, to, to provide those opportunities because they need to stay strong and be conditioned. And like, how do you know if a, if a tortoise gets overweight? Can it they? very rarely happens. It can happen. It doesn't uh-huh. happen a lot. It would happen more with uh, poor husbandry. Like if they were in a very small containment and weren't able to roam, uh, and then we're being overfed like sweets and things like that. Oh, um, oh they like sweets, do they? Oh, she loves sweets, but it's not, it's not part of her diet. Yeah. <laughs> they aren't supposed to have any fruit. They're barely supposed to have fresh vegetable because it has too much sugar in it for them wow. to digest. She's really, she's supposed to eat almost exclusively hay and grass. Um, we obviously treat her to some like yummier things every once in a while because we're not perfect and neither is she like, you know, I eat a cupcake here and there too. So (laughs) it's not good for me either, but, (laughs) um, uh, that's the luxury of being part of a (laughs) family. Right. Well, and I saw her munching on a, uh, prickly pear. Those are actually fine for her. They, those have, those are really high in calcium and, uh, fiber. So those are a part of her. Um, oh, she loved it. Not regular diet because they don't grow fast enough for it to be part right, of a regular right. diet, but um, I'll give them to her every once in a while. But then they're very high in water content, so I run the risk of having to clean up that mess later. Ah, so, yeah. mm-hmm. Do tortoises so, <laughs> have teeth? Do they have teeth? No. Okay. No, she has a beak. Okay. So uh, if you look at her little front uh, lips, they look kind of like lips, but it's actually just like a hard beak. So she just crunches with that and then swallows it whole. Wow. <laughs> I know it's kind of crazy, but <laughs> I still take a big it. bite of something every <laughs> once in a while. And you're like, what? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I just learned so much here, Chris, about tortoises today. I'm so glad we had Casey <laughs> on the show today. Yes, yes. Um, and I, I think, you know, as we're, we're, we're wrapping up here, Casey, can you 
Do you have anything that you want to share with the audience, some pearl of wisdom, something about tortoises you think everybody should know? Um, They're a really good pet if you are uh, not interested in too much affection. I think that's where people kind of get the wrong idea. They think, oh, I'll have this cute little tortoise. They see like an Instagram page like mine or somebody's and think that they're going to have the same kind of tortoise that we have. That's going to be uh, interested in being around people. And that's really not always the case. Tortoises are not meant to be affectionate. Reptiles in general are not meant to be affectionate. That's not how they're wired. Uh, If you want an affectionate pet, get a cat or a dog, (laughs) you know, get something snuggly. They're not a snuggly pet. Um, They're also very messy. And it's, it's kind of like, if you are up for that lifestyle, then like, absolutely a very fun pet to have really Mm -hmm. interesting, very like different. Mm -hmm. And you're going to get a lot of, you're going to get a lot out of it too. But you know, it's not for everybody. (laughs) And a lifetime investment. Yeah. Yes. I mean, so. <laughs> well, I'm just going to throw this in here because uh, I find this stuff fascinating. And Kathy knows this, and now you're going to know this too, Casey. But I love to research and come up with some different uh, pearls likes, of information. She likes statistics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and we've touched on a lot of those. But in terms of anatomy, you know, Kathy had asked about, you know, does her shell have sensation? And yes. So primarily... Uh, mechanical receptors and feeling vibration, as you alluded to, Casey. But, you know, there are all kinds of things out there on the internet, too, where people are, you know, gluing and drilling oh. and doing all of these awful things to the shell of a turtle or tortoise. And that's just horrible um, for obvious reasons. But what I think a lot of people don't know is that the, the very center longitudinally from head to tail is actually their spine Mm -hmm. and their spinal cord is, you know, encased within that. And then the nerves go out and each side of the shell is kind of a evolution of their ribs and mm-hmm. then they have the plates on top called the scoots and all of this stuff can, can feel. So the yep. very top shell is the carapace. And then they have a bridge that connects to the block bottom shell, which is called the plastron, mm-hmm. just a little bit of anatomy information. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then, you know, you mentioned too, that, that they can write themselves. They can flip themselves uh, back over, which I didn't know until I, I researched, but uh, they also, we're saying the experts on the internet that <laughs> even though they can flip themselves back over that, if you see a tortoise that's struggling and upside down, please help it to write itself yeah, because definitely, <laughs> yeah, they aren't the most agile, but I guess the turtles don't have that issue because they're mainly in the, the water and, and things like that. So, uh, I mean, if you saw a turtle on land and it was upside down, absolutely. You need For to put sure. it over because they'd have even more trouble getting righted. <laughs> yeah. Because they don't have that, that deep. Mm-hmm shell Mm -hmm. kind of rock because I think they kind of rock and and yeah they just that dome yeah exactly they rock back and forth and hopefully there's some sort of pebbles or something they can kind of grip onto with their arm on the other side and then they'll kind of like grab onto whatever they can grab onto and hopefully be able to pull themselves over wow um I've seen Ethel do it a couple times I obviously if she ever I mean she hasn't since she was much smaller um, gotten upside down but if we ever see her stuck anywhere we just immediately write her because I'm not trying to let her live her life with struggle, yeah. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. but mostly it's because also, like you said, so it's kind of like, if you imagine our rib cage and like all the things that hold our organs, like that whole bone structure was just on the outside. So mm-hmm. like, if we just like took that whole thing and put our arms and legs inside of it, <laughs> and yeah. like, that would basically be how a tortoise is. Yes. Um, and then their lungs are on the back. So their lungs rest just on the back of their, their spine right there. Like the spine comes off of the shell, like you said. Um, and then that's why if they're on their back too long, it's hard for them to breathe. Oh. So, uh, so the longer they are in that position, the, the more of a struggle and a stress it puts on their body. So that definitely like, if you see one upside down, don't let it struggle. Like just, right, right. <laughs> just ride it so it can catch its breath. <laughs> but Well, and one of, one of my greatest pleasures in my life is, is that I had the opportunity to go to the Galapagos and we saw the giant Galapagos tortoises. And, uh, I even have a picture of me (laughs) 
hanging on the wall with a with a tortoise. And of course, we couldn't get too close. We had to be respectful and so forth that they were huge. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think Galapagos tortoises have like just a wild life expectancy. Like, I don't even know what it is, but it's well over 100 years, isn't it? I, I don't know either. I didn't get that bit of information, but yeah, so cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's obvious just listening to you, Casey, you know, how much, you know, you know, about your pet. This is just wonderful. Yes. Great. Thank yeah, you. I love I love talking tortoise. So oh, you know. you <laughs> it's That's probably good. my favorite thing to talk about. And if anybody ever is like, "Do you want to talk about tortoises?" I'm like, Just "How much Casey. time do you got? Yeah. How much time do you have?" Because <laughs> so, Casey, that leads me to my next question: um, Where can people? Can you let our audience know where can people find you? Uh, Instagram mostly mm -hmm. uh, Ethel the Glamour Tort. So you're going to look for Ethel the Glamour Tort on all all platforms. So we have Instagram, we have Facebook and we have TikTok now as well. We'll put that uh, in our show notes. So people yes, can we'll put it in our show notes and, and I'm going to just spell it. So it's E T H E L T H E G L A M O U R T O R T. Yeah. And we didn't even really talk about it, but you'll see where the glamour tort comes in when you go look at the profile. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll leave that, look. that little, uh, that'll teaser. be a mystery. You get yeah. to see what yeah. that's all about yeah. later. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, Casey. Thank you so much for, for being on the show. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for course. your time and expertise. Fun. Yeah. I love it when people are interested in, uh, my world. It's kind of cool. <laughs> so yeah. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed our show. Follow us on Facebook or on Instagram at Petability Podcast. For more information about Kathy's books and living with blind dogs, please go to EnableYourPet.com. Thank you and please tune in next time.